Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Bruce Perry and this is the first session of the Child Trauma Academy's seven slide series. The seven slide series is a set of presentations intended to be brief but helpful in your work. This first session is on the human brain. There are, of course, many things I can say about the human brain, not the least of which is that it is the most remarkable problem-solving machine known in the universe. It is astoundingly complex, comprised of between 80 and 100 billion neurons with 10 times as many glial cells. All of these cells are constructed in ways that create a variety of components. As you can see from this image, the brain actually has multiple parts. There are lower areas and there's higher areas and this image gives you a little bit of a representation of some of the internal structures of the brain. Bottom line is, this remarkable organ in all of its complexity allows human beings to do things that are unlike any other species. One of the most remarkable things about the human brain is that it is capable of absorbing and storing more bits of information than any other species brain. This allows us to essentially absorb the accumulated experiences from previous generations. The other wonderful quality about the human brain is that it's fundamentally a social organ. It allows human beings to create relationships. And these relationships allow us to essentially unify and connect our brains in ways that allow us to solve problems, to invent, create, and be productive in ways that are magnified beyond the individual and are essentially a reflection of the group. Human beings are fundamentally social creatures and that brain is the organ that allows us to be social. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the micro-architecture of the brain. As I said before, neurons and glial cells are present in the brain. There's way many more glial cells than, than neurons, but neurons are particularly important because of their capacity for communication. The typical neuron, and again this is just a drawing, they're much more complex than this, but a typical neuron has a receptive area, and, and the receptive areas include dendrites. On the dendrites are receptors that are uh, responsive to chemicals or neurotransmitters, neuromodulators released by other neurons. And when there's sufficient summed activity and stimulation in the dendrites, there will be the transmission of a signal down the neuron, down the axon, to the presynaptic terminal, where a signal will result in the release of this neuron's neurotransmitter. That will then go out and stimulate another neuron, and the result is a chain of interconnected neurons that work together to allow complex functions to occur. Now the majority of neurons <clears throat> in your brain are what we would call intrinsic neurons. They have a receptive projection and a uh, cell body all within the same little area. So if you took a little part of the cortex and looked at it under a microscope, you'd see thousands and thousands of cells, neurons, that have dendritic trees, cell bodies, and then synaptic terminals, but all within the same little area. Now the interesting thing is that because of the complexity of the brain and all of the moving parts of the brain, there have to be some ways to organize and orchestrate functioning across all these different brain regions and throughout these different interconnected networks. And so there are certain neural networks, some of which you've heard of, serotonergic, noradrenergic, dopaminergic. These, these networks have 
cell bodies and receptive areas that are in lower areas of the brain, and they send projections both upstream into multiple parts of the brain and downstream out into the body or actually influence the outflow into the, from the brain into the body. So that these cells, these neural networks down here, have disproportionate power in influencing and orchestrating function across multiple parts of the brain. And as we'll talk about later on, this unique microarchitecture gives them a particularly important role in the stress response. <clears throat> in this slide, what we're trying to illustrate is the fact that the brain is continually getting input from the outside world and from the inside world. And we all know about our five senses, sight, smell, touch, taste, hearing, all of these sensory apparatus translate physical energy into patterned neuronal activity that goes into lower parts of the brain and essentially helps tell the brain what's going on in the outside world. Similarly, you have sensory apparatus in your body that are continually sending signals up into the lower parts of the brain telling you where you are in space, telling you how much oxygen you have, telling you things about your heart and your muscles and your lungs. And collectively, this input from the outside world and the inside world is continually monitored, stored, and acted on by the brain. All of this is to keep you in equilibrium, to keep you healthy and safe and ensure that you have the capacity to be a healthy and productive member of your living group. One of the unique properties of the brain that we'll talk about quite a bit in this series is the capacity for the brain to process information and act on that information at multiple levels. Now, <clears throat> as we'll talk about a lot, the brain is simpler in the lower areas and it gets more complex in the top areas. And the top areas mediate these complex human functions like thinking and speech and language. The middle areas of the brain, like limbic areas, mediate more emotional content. The diencephalic parts of the brain and the cerebellum are involved in modulating and regulating a variety of functions, including some motor activities, and in the lower parts of the brain are involved in these fundamental physiological activities. So what can happen is, as information comes in from the outside world about a given experience, let's say that it's an interaction with a colleague at work and it's a hostile interaction, your brain basically will tell your body to increase your heart rate. It will tell uh, parts of your brain to basically change your body posture. It will tell parts of your brain that you are feeling uh, frustrated and irritated and maybe even angry. And then it will tell parts of your brain what kinds of words you should use. And sometimes the problem is, because there's a sequential processing, sometimes you act on information before you actually have time to process it in this really smart human part of our brains. Precortical processing, multi-level processing, is one of the most important aspects of understanding human behavior, and we will return to this concept many times in future series. But keep in mind this fundamental architecture about how the brain is organized and how it processes information sequentially, and that every experience has the potential to elicit a variety of responses from the person mediated by a variety of parts of the brain. You can get tense, you can get angry, and you can have a thought, and all of these are brain-mediated, but mediated by different networks in the brain. The final point I want to make is that the brain is remarkably complex and it's malleable. The brain is plastic. The brain has a capacity to change. And as you go from the, the simpler and lower parts of the brain up into the more complex parts of the brain, plasticity is, e, is more 
if you will, powerful. The top parts of the brain are easier to change and more responsive to experience than the lower parts of the brain. And again, when we talk about development, we'll talk a little bit about the process of organizing the brain in a use-dependent way and how pattern repetitive experiences influence neural networks and make them change how they work. But always keep in mind that the more moving parts there are, the more cells, the more dynamically active any part of the brain is, the easier it will be to modify and influence and change that part of the brain. In other words, neuroplasticity tracks with dynamic activity. And the cortex is the most dynamically active part of your brain. It has more moving parts, and it's therefore easier to change and influence. Final point <clears throat> about how the brain is organized is, is that our cortex, our, the, the most powerful part of our brain, plays a major role in modulating and regulating our impulsivity, and all of the functions mediated by these lower parts of the brain. Now, it's somewhat inaccurate, but the fact is the lower parts of the brain are a little bit more primitive. They're more regulatory, uh, you know, the, the concept of time, uh, many, many, many of the more complex and abstract capabilities that are mediated by the top part of our brain are not possible and cannot be mediated by these lower parts of the brain. So as the brain is organizing, from the bottom to the top, you, over time, during development, become more capable of modulating your impulsivity, your frustration, and so forth. And we all see this in normal child development. Anything that compromises the development or the functioning of the cortex is going to result in compromised cortical modulation. And so that could be anything from a head injury, to uh, drinking alcohol, to having developmental neglect where there's underdevelopment of parts of the cortex. All of those things will lead to a higher probability that a person will have challenges regulating themselves. And later on when we talk about executive functioning, one of the major mechanisms of executive functioning is the balance between how strong your cortex is, how well developed it is, and how functional it is, relative to how disorganized the lower part of the brain is. So, that's the end of this seven slide series presentation. For future topics, stay tuned to the Child Trauma Academy website. We will be talking about a variety of things, including the stress response, state dependent functioning, sensitization and tolerance, and a whole range of other brief topics that will hopefully be helpful to you in your work. Thank you.